Thank you. Joyce is very gentle in her admonitions to move forward, but um, I, I'm a little less gentle. And it really would be nice if some of you came forward. I'm going to save lots of time for discussion. So if, I promise I don't bite, nor does Joyce. And um, we really would like this to be as informal and interactive as possible. Thank you. My topic today as maybe I should wait for, since I admonished you to move. <laughs> maybe I should let you move and then start. <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> My topic today is college in prison. And I'd like to begin with a story. In the fall of 2008, I was sitting in the waiting room of a medium security prison in upstate New York. I had been searched and processed and was waiting for an escort to take me inside the prison to teach. I was then, and am still, as Joyce mentioned, deeply involved in the Bard Prison Initiative, a full liberal arts college program that awards associates and bachelor's degrees inside six New York State prisons. As I waited for my escort, a truck pulled up loaded with pumpkins. Several men in green prison uniforms got out and began to unload the pumpkins for a Halloween display. One of the things I've learned about prisons is they love having seasonal displays in the front of the prison. A colleague pointed, out, pointed to one of the guys handling the pumpkins and elbowed me and said, that's Tone, whose full name is Anthony Cardinalis. He was famous as a stick-up artist who had robbed other drug dealers before being sent to prison at the age of 17 to serve a sentence of 17 years to life. His story, disguised as the story of a young man named Cesar, had been included in a book I had just read, an extraordinary book, entitled Random Family, Love, Drugs, Trouble, and Coming of Age in the Bronx. Soon after I first saw him, Tone was released and went home. Today, not that many years later, he is Vice President of Administration at Hugo New Recycling in Westchester, New York. How did Tone go from being an impulsive and often violent young man, always ready to draw a gun, to a mature, successful, tax-paying businessman and a model for youth growing up behind him in the Bronx? Tone would tell you that the most important factor was going to college while he was in prison. When he was initially sentenced to prison, Tone was a high school dropout with minimal literacy skills. He had completed a GED earlier while incarcerated in a juvenile facility. He then earned an associate's and a bachelor's degree from Bard College through its prison initiative. If he were here with us today, Tone would insist that going to college gave him the confidence and sense of possibility that enabled him to begin again after his release from prison. When he was released, he had been locked up for half of his life. College and prison programs have existed in various forms in the United States since the 19th century. But today, they are relatively rare. There are lots of poetry workshops and acting classes and Shakespeare programs. There are hundreds of inside-out partnerships between colleges and correctional facilities, which allow a faculty member to take undergraduates into a prison to join prisoners for a semester of study. But there are very few degree-granting college programs and only a handful that offer a rigorous liberal arts curriculum. The program from which Tone graduated and with which I am affiliated is one of those. Most of the once plentiful college programs closed their doors in 1994 when Pell Grant eligibility was removed from prisoners. That decision was both irrational and extremely unfortunate, and it's in everyone's best interest that it be reversed. As I shall explain, there are at least three sets of reasons, economic, social, and civic, why reinstating financial aid for college and prison makes sense. 
I want to say a word about each of these different reasons, beginning with the economic. As you probably know, prisons are extremely expensive. They have revolving doors which increase the cost to taxpayers. Nationwide, return rates to prison run around 50 percent. Anything that can be done to lower rates of return to prison lowers the costs of incarceration. That's important for many reasons, not least because clear correlations exist between increasing spending for prisons and decreasing spending on higher education. In 2010, 33 of the 50 states saw an increased percentage of their general funds go to corrections, accompanied by a decrease in spending for both K-12 and higher education. Relative to the overall costs of holding someone in prison, the costs of sending that person to college are small. Tone's college education over seven years cost roughly $35,000. What might be thought of as his room and board cost more than $420,000. New York State currently holds 56,000 people in prison. At a cost per person of $60,000 a year, the tab runs to more than $3 billion. Many among the 56,000 inmates are returnees. If they had had the educational opportunities Tone had, the likelihood is that they would, have, would not have returned. Among barred alums who have earned a degree, the return to prison rate is 2%. In addition to the economic benefits of college and prison, there is strong evidence of notable social benefits. They begin on the insides of prison and carry over to the outside. Prisons are dangerous and often violent places. Having a college program can make a correctional facility a somewhat more peaceful and tolerable place for both the inmates and the correctional staff. Educational programs can counter what prisoners describe as the mind-numbing boredom and purposelessness they experience. One man told a set of interviewers, and I'm quoting, for me and many like me in prison, violence is not the major problem. The major problem is monotony. It is the dull sameness of prison life, its idleness and boredom. Nothing matters, everything's inconsequential, other than when will you be free and how to make the time pass until then. But boredom, time-slowing boredom, interrupted by occasional bursts of fear and anger, is the governing reality of life in prison. College and prison programs can counter what are known as, as the criminogenic effects of being incarcerated. In the stark terms of a 2014 NRC report, imprisonment causes harms, harm to prisoners. Psychiatrist James Gilligan, who has worked extensively inside prisons, maintains that education is one of the most powerful tools for acquiring self-esteem. And since self-esteem is the most powerful psychological force that prevents violence, it is not surprising that education inside prisons lessens violence. Going to college while incarcerated fosters a sense of agency and optimism, and that has important spillover effects outside of the prison, especially in helping the children of prisoners. Children of prisoners often feel shamed as a result of their parents' situation. Having a parent in college can counteract that. The daughter of a woman enrolled in a college program told researchers that she brags about her mother going to college to all of her teachers. The fact that most people in prison come from families and neighborhoods where college going is rare heightens the significance of having an incarcerated parent be the first to receive an advanced degree. My mother is the only person I know who went to college is not an atypical comment. The boost college and prison can provide to children is vitally important. There were 2.7 million children with at least one parent behind bars in 2010. 
That amounts to one out of every 28 American children and one out of every nine African American children, most of whom are under the age of 10. There is abundant evidence concerning the emotional damage parental incarceration inflicts. Children of the incarcerated are more likely to drop out of school. One study found that 23 percent of children with a father who had been incarcerated had been expelled or suspended from school, compared to 4 percent of children with non-incarcerated fathers. Children with parents in prison are six times more likely to go to prison themselves. Anything that reduces the injury to the children of the incarcerated is therefore likely to have a positive social benefit. If children grow up to be economically productive and civically responsible, we all gain. If they don't, we all pay. Offering prisoners opportunities to go to college while incarcerated also benefits the neighborhoods from which most of the prisoners come and to which 97 percent of them will return. In New York State, prisoners tend to come from what the New York State, the New York Police Department calls dead zone neighborhoods, where unemployment, poverty, and crime are rife. In such neighborhoods, crime spills out of prisons and back into the streets. Going to prison has become a rite de passage for young men. Many young men are socialized at an early age to go to prison. They are hostile to authority and act against it. They see the schools as the, as the outposts of mainstream society and resist their requirements and demands. Prior to the mass incarceration era, law applying employed adults, old heads, to use a term invented by the anthropologist Elijah Anderson, were expected to teach, support, encourage, and in effect socialize young men to meet their responsibilities. Today, the attraction of the street has undermined the prestige and authority of these exemplars of maturity and stability. High incarceration neighborhoods lack what is known as collective efficacy, the bonds of trust and mutuality among neighbors that encourage people to involve themselves in the behavior of young people and the general well-being of their community. That erodes the social fabric of a neighborhood leaving it more open to crime and physical decline. Policing, even responsible community policing, cannot alone turn such a neighborhood around. People like Anthony Cardinalis, Tone, must help with that. College-educated men who have known the street and left it and who want to work with young people to help them avoid the mistakes they made are crucial. They can serve as models for success through education. They have credibility and local knowledge. They can help alter the trajectory of young lives and devastated neighborhoods. When former prisoners go home with a college credential or even just a few college credits, they are more likely to help rebuild a neighborhood than to contribute again to its dysfunction. Finally, in addition to the economic and social benefits college and prison affords, there is the matter of civic competence and political inclusion. It is unfortunately true that mass incarceration has resulted in the disenfranchisement of millions of American, Americans. On election day in 2004, 5.3 million men and women could not vote owing to a felony conviction. Of those, only 27 percent were still in prison or jail. Just like mass incarceration generally, disenfranchisement falls most severely on African Americans. In 14 states, one in 10 African Americans cannot vote. In five states, 20 percent of the American, African American population cannot vote. State laws defining who can and cannot vote vary tremendously. On one end of the spectrum, Maine and Vermont allow all felons to vote. On the other end of the spectrum, 13 states bar felons from voting unless their rights are restored. 
In Florida, some felons qualify for an automatic reinstatement of their voting rights, but most must go through a hearing to have their rights restored. These are held quarterly, with the governor presiding. According to a story reported for the New York Times in 2004, then-Governor Jeb Bush opened one such meeting, hearing for 57 ex-offenders, saying, quote, Don't be nervous. We're not mean people. You can just speak from the heart. Then, the ex-offenders were questioned as to whether they still had a drinking or drug problem or could now control their anger. After that, the rights of 23 felons were restored, 30 were rejected, and four were delayed. When Susan B. Anthony was tried in 1872 for attempting to vote, she announced to the court, your denial of my citizens' right to vote is the denial of my right to consent as one of the governed, the denial of my right to representation as one of the taxed. Therefore, it is the denial of my sacred right to life, liberty, and property. People who are denied their right to vote are merely partial citizens. But even as partial citizens, they must be enabled to exercise those aspects of citizenship that are inalienable. The right to think, speak, and join in public debate. The responsibility to obey the law and to work to change it if it's unjust. And finally, the right to associate with others in common cause, to clean up neighborhood parks, improve working conditions, petition for immigration reform, or lobby for changes in criminal justice policy. Trust between local governments, especially but not only as represented by the police and minority communities, may be at an all-time low point in the United States today. Behind the proximate causes for that are the more structural causes, including inequality, mass incarceration, and felon disenfranchisement. Unless people have peaceful ways to gain a hearing for their opinions and constructive avenues to effect change, they will turn to violent ones. In college, incarcerated men and women can articulate their grievances. They can study the history of previous movements for social change, acquire a better understanding of our Constitution and the American political system, and otherwise become accomplished in the knowledge and skills of civic literacy. I could go on and on, I mean, I could put you to sleep going on and on, about the harm mass incarceration has inflicted on so many people, really on all of us. And I could say a lot more about the ways going to college and prison can help counteract that harm. But I want to stop here and turn to an underlying question. In spite of lots of evidence concerning the value of enabling prisoners to go to college, degree-granting college programs are extremely scarce. Why have prisoners been denied the financial aid they need to get the levels of education they must have if they are to have a chance to turn their lives around? The short answer is a confluence of three factors. Race, the get-tough policies that began as a backlash against the hard-won victories of the 1960s civil rights movement, and the country's general turn to the right politically. All those things fed mass incarceration and the arrest, conviction, and imprisonment of a disproportionate share of young male African Americans. Then, as mass incarceration picked up steam, the terms of imprisonment became more and more harsh. As part of that, educational programs were cut and eligibility for Pell Grant assistance to pay for college was terminated. That happened when Bill Clinton signed the most draconian crime bill in American history, the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. That act included an amendment that denied prisoners eligibility to apply for Pell Grants. The amendment ending Pell eligibility 
had first been proposed in 1991 by none other than Senator Jesse Helms, the Republican from North Carolina. As you may recall, Helms had voted against all sorts of things, school lunches and aid to the disabled, civil rights legislation, and federal funding for HIV-AIDS research. His views reflected his small-town Southern background. He had been born in 1920 in Monroe, North Carolina, home to an active chapter of the Klan. His father, known simply as Mr. Jesse, was the police chief of Monroe. One resident recalled watching Mr. Jesse beat a black woman on the street before dragging her off to jail, screaming as Mr. Jesse pulled her along the concrete pavement with her skirt above her head. Proud of his father, Helms often made overtly racist statements on the campaign trail and in press interviews. He claimed that civil rights workers were communists and sex perverts. He argued that Negroes did not need civil rights protection, although white women did. Later, in 1981, as he began to focus on crime, he simply said, crime rates and irresponsibility among Negroes are a fact of life which must be faced. Given his undisguised bigoted views, it is hardly surprising that it was Helms who introduced the idea of denying Pell Grant eligibility to all prisoners. As Helms told his Senate colleagues in barely disguised racial code, the action would demonstrate that the U.S. Congress was on the side of hardworking, struggling Americans rather than deadbeat criminals. To reinforce that point, Helms read a letter from a man named Bill Tetterton of Plymouth, North Carolina, into the congressional record. According to Helms, and this is too good, I have trouble believing this, but according to Helms, Tetterton was the owner of the Little Man Restaurant. He and his wife were struggling to put three children through college. Now I find out, Mr. Tetterton told Helms in the letter, there was an easy way to accomplish this. I could have brought each one of my kids a gun and sent them out to commit a crime, and their education probably would have been paid for. Complaining that honest, hardworking people were being blasted with taxes, Tetterton wanted Helms to tell him why he should struggle to pay taxes and tuitions when, quote, the criminals get light sentences, early release, lawyers paid for, air-conditioned cells with color TV and carpet, plus a college education. I've never seen any of these things in a prison, I have to tell you. For a variety of procedural reasons, Helms' proposed amendment was defeated. Then, in 1993, the question of financial aid for prisoners was raised again as Congress debated the Clinton crime bill. This time, first-term Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, a Republican from Texas, proposed the exclusion of prisoners. According to Hutchison, the American people are frustrated by a federal government and a Congress that cannot seem to get priorities straight. They are frustrated and angered by a federal government that sets rules that puts convicts at the head of the line for college financial aid, crowding out law-abiding citizens. Her argument apparently hit home. The amendment passed by a large majority. There was opposition voiced by various lobbying groups, but there was only one lone voice raised in opposition in the Senate. Claiborne Pell, a Republican from Rhode Island, insisted that going to college reduced recidivism and therefore made economic sense. It costs more to send a young man or young woman to jail than to Yale, he stated, and that was true. In the House, where all but one of the opponents of the Pell Grant restrictions were members of the Congressional Black Caucus, John Conyer reminded his colleagues that more young black men were in prison than in college. Prison may be one of the first opportunities many of them have had to receive an education, he noted. Without it, he cautioned, we are in danger of losing a whole generation. That was true, too. No matter, by the mid-1990s, being tough on crime, which meant being tough on the urban poor, 
most of whom were African American or Hispanic, had gained such high popular salience that reasoned arguments in favor of education in prison fell on dead ears. Of course, denying prisoners access to college denies them a basic civil right, the right established in Brown to equal educational opportunity. But prisoners are denied many rights held by others. In fact, when men and women are convicted of a crime, they enter a legal limbo that is akin to slavery. Recall the wording of the 13th Amendment to our Constitution, passed in 1865. Quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States. In the 21st century, when going to college is so closely linked to one's subsequent life chances, and when major philanthropies are promoting the idea of college for all, continuing to deny prisoners access to college is reminiscent of denying slaves access to literacy. Access to college must be reinstated. How then can people involved in education research help bring that about? They can, of course, contribute further to the evidence concerning the benefits of educating people in prison. They can also contribute to a better understanding of which kinds of post-secondary programs have the greatest impact and why that is. The most important role for education research, however, is larger and somewhat dish, tr different from um, traditional scholarly work. It is to study, help develop and implement, and then evaluate and refine programs directed at counteracting the values and attitudes that have led the American public to support such a harsh punishment regime a punishment regime that has made the United States anomalous in comparison to other developed countries around the world. Mass incarceration is one of the most egregious social failures in the history of the United States. Thanks to increasing press coverage, beginning with the 2008 report of the Pew Charitable Trusts, documenting that one in a hundred Americans were then living behind bars, the scandalous policies and practices that have imprisoned so many people, especially young African-American men, have become quite well known. Partly for that reason, and partly due to budget constraints, there are increasing efforts to find alternatives to imprisonment. That's all to the good. But the public's attention is fickle, and economic rationales for curtailing imprisonment are not likely to withstand a new hysteria-generating event, a new Willie Horton episode. To develop a firmer basis from which to advocate for more equal rights for prisoners, including the right to a full and equal education at public expense, there needs to be more plentiful, powerful, and sustained opportunities for people to confront the root causes of the get-tough policies that have governed criminal justice in the U.S. since the early 1970s. Racism is one of those root causes, a central one. And as a nation, we need new structures and new curricula to help all of us, young and old, black, brown, and white, come to terms with the deep-seated fears and prejudices that our history of slavery has bequeathed to all of us. Building on existing knowledge and current research, education researchers can help invent, implement, assess, and redesign those structures and curricula. Some people are already doing this work, but there's much more that needs to be done. Let me give you an example of what I think we need. It's well established that children who have attended desegregated schools are more likely as adults to work and live in racially diverse settings. Given that so many of our schools remain segregated, something must be done to offer young people out-of-school opportunities to engage with and learn from people different from themselves. I've long been a proponent of national service, and that might provide a structure for the kind of educational program I think we need. Why not design a system that would encourage many 
perhaps even all, young people between the ages of 16 and 24 to spend a year or two away from their home communities working with others on human service, environmental, infrastructure, or cultural projects. Why not develop a public service draft? The WPA is a historic example of what I mean, and City Year is a contemporary example. Perhaps through research, different models could be planned and implemented with very careful monitoring of both short and long-term outcomes. To work toward attitudes and values conducive to less harsh and more socially beneficial criminal justice policies, adults must also be engaged in anti-racism and education. We too often put everything on the children. There are many ways this could be done. Consider something as simple, maybe even simplistic, as this. Some years ago, Nancy Pearl, a librarian in Seattle, initiated the idea of having an entire community read the same book at the same time. This was then tried in other cities, Buffalo, Rochester, Boise, Idaho among them. The largest city to adopt the idea was Chicago, where public libraries, bookstores, theaters, and even Starbucks outlets helped promote the reading of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird in 2001. I have no idea what, if any, the outcomes of these book events were. But research could assess whether and how reading and discussing a powerful book about slavery or mass incarceration could help strengthen a multiracial community of concern to address problems of inequality and social injustice. My purpose here is not to generate a blueprint for how this might be done but rather to suggest that education research can and should play a vital role in efforts to change criminal justice policies. Through research, we need to discover how racism in all its manifestations can be more purposively and effectively countered, and belief in the importance of education for all, really for all, more enduringly strengthened. Only in that way can the conscious and even the unconscious foundational beliefs that have governed the harsh punishment regime of the last 40 years be undermined. And make no mistake, that harsh punishment re regime is of a piece with a larger punitive policy orientation that has shredded the social safety net for all who need public assistance and opened public schools and teachers to such harsh scrutiny and criticism. It has been well established that mass incarceration is not the cause for lowered crime rates. Prisons do not make us safe. An educated workforce and an active engaged citizenry makes us safe. Without equal rights to education, our economy will continue to suffer and so will our democracy. It is time to offer access to college for all, even and perhaps especially those now living behind bars. And people involved in education, research, must help bring that about. Thank you.